The Maps Journal Club is a monthly academic discussion of psychedelic studies started by students from the University of Toronto, McMaster, and Queen's University. So our next speaker is Manish Gurn. Uh, Manish is a currently a PhD student in neuroscience at McGill University and has been lead or co-author on over a dozen scientific publications and book chapters on topics including psychedelics, meditation, daydreaming, and the default mode network. He's currently conducting research on the brain mechanisms underlying LSD, psilocybin, and DMT in collaboration with Dr. Robin Carr Harris and others from ICL uh, Center for Public or Psych Center for Psychedelic Research. In his free time, he also runs our YouTube channel, The Psychedelic Scientist, where he discusses the latest finding in psychedelic science in an easy to understand but non-superficial form. And uh, Manesh will be posting the link to that later, just so you can all check it out. Um, and so with that, Manesh, please feel free to take it away. Awesome, thank you, Leo. Let me share my screen. All right, can everyone see that? Yeah, that's good. Cool, so today I'm gonna be talking about this paper um, I wrote about a year and a half ago now, and it's like, um, Basically, it's applying a particular model to different types of a model of different types of thoughts um, to creativity and to psychedelics and kind of unifying them uh, within this framework. And so I'll jump right into it. So first, it's very basic. What is creativity as in how how do scientists usually op um, operationalize creativity? And so the typical definition that's thrown out there is um, there are two components of what constitutes um, creativity or, or a creative output. And uh, it has to be novel, um, aka original, unique, or inventive, and also useful, so appropriate, adapted, valuable. And if something is deemed to have both of these um, uh, aspects to it, then it's deemed to be a creative output. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of variability around here and um, how exactly novel and useful, et cetera, are defined is based on the domain. So it's gonna be very different if you're a painter creating something or an engineer, uh, engineer where you kind of have a more constrained space of creativity, there's obviously real physical constraints there. You don't have that painting, you don't have music. You know, music perhaps can be evaluated based on the emotion it evokes, not so much engineering perhaps, but it's not an emphasis, et cetera. So within this framework of novel and most useful, there's also a lot of variability, um, but we can remember those two different uh, criteria for determining whether something is a so quote unquote creative output. And um, something about creativity too, is that it's not a singular mental state. It's not like, okay, now creativity is happening. And uh, it's a bit more nuanced than that. And in particular, it's uh, dynamic. So um, during the creative process, we're not just engaging in the same type of thinking continuously. We're moving towards different orientations to thought or different modes of thinking. And two that have been emphasized in the scientific literature in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience of creativity is distinguishing the two states of creative generation versus creative evaluation. Um, so basically creative generation, as it suggests, is the uh, phase or mode of thought where you're more oriented towards creating ideas. Um, so often as any creative person might know, like it, it, when you're in the creative zone and the purpose is to output things. You don't want to be evaluating in that moment. You don't want to be kind of constraining and evaluating each thing. You kind of want to let your juices flow and just create in a kind of exploratory way. So that state um, can be called creative generation when you're trying to, in an exploratory, relatively unconstrained way, create ideas or create whatever output you're making uh, in that context. And then a more uh, distinct stage, which is uh, distinct in terms of the brain as well, and which we'll get into, is creative evaluation. And so this, again, as it suggests, is the phase in which you evaluate your creative products or, or ideas and to see, is this really something that's valuable? Is it, is it novel? Is it useful? You know, valuable, appropriate, innovative, etc. So this is when you evaluate which ones are good or not, essentially. And um, also I should mention, and I'll get into this again later, uh, that each of these states can take a variety of forms. So creative generation, it, for example, you can vary in how much uh, you're constraining your creativity. Uh, maybe you're, you want to be creative to solve a specific problem, or maybe you're just allowing anything to come to you at all. And so there's a variety of ways you could um, generate ideas. 
and kind of what I was talking about before with the different domains of creativity, you can evaluate it in different ways. Sometimes you will evaluate, like, evaluate it and does it you know, fit the specific purpose that you needed it or does it, uh, or you might evaluate it in a more of an emotional, emotional effective way. Uh, like how does this make me feel? Does it convey the, the felt quality that um, I wanted to, et cetera. And, and it's not like you just generate ideas, then you evaluate them, then you're done. A lot of times it's not like that. And you go back and forth uh, between generating, evaluating, maybe refining a bit, generating again, and then back and forth until you converge on something that you're satisfied with. So it's kind of this, we can characterize creativity as a dynamic iterative process between two broadly uh, dissociable states, uh, creative generation and creative evaluation. Um, and this has been characterized in, in multiple studies um, with brain imaging and also just cognitive psychology uh, paradigms. And so let's move into the paper. Um, so as I mentioned, it situates creativity in the context of other types of thought. And um, I'll just dive into this right here. So, um, so this space uh, that links these different types of thought and thought is defined very loosely here. So in including under thought, um, so-called goal-directed thought, which is thought when you're problem solving, you're focused on a problem, you know, you need to finish that paper, you're doing some data analysis, you're focused. Um, and then rumination and obsessive thought is um, what it suggests when you're kind of lost in a thought train that's very emotionally oriented or, or motivated. And then uh, spontaneous thought, which is you can characterize it uh, as this whole section here, where it's this thought that emerges um, automatically uh, and that encapsulates mind wandering, creativity, dreaming, and psychedelics. Um, and to kind of go into a bit more detail, so these two dimensions that are differentiating these different types of thoughts are um, two types of constraint. And so these are automatic constraints and deliberate constraints. So deliberate constraints are constraints um, based in our attention. So we're deliberately, consciously, top-down directing our attention towards um, towards something, towards towards creating a certain thought pattern, you could say. And um, if you can see on this axis, like the x-axis here, uh, it goes from weak to strong. So when your deliberate constraints, your top-down focus attention is very high, that corresponds with goal-directed thought. Makes sense. Um, and when it's weak, then you get stuff like psychedelics and dreaming, which is less, you're less, um, there's less of conscious control going on. It's more of a free flow experience that is happening, again, outside your conscious control. So this deliberate constraint axis kind of indexes that. And this kind of Y axis, the automatic constraints corresponds to um, emotional, primarily to emotional automatic kind of um, externally driven attention, you could say stimulus driven attention. And so uh, you could see the extreme of that is rumination, because that's when, again, you have this emotionally charged set of thoughts that you just can't escape from and you just keep diving into that and, and exploring it in a kind of this like sticky, um, you know, uh, gravitational way that it pulls you in. Um, so that would be rumination obsessive thought. And again, we're putting psychedelics here close to dreaming in that. Um, of course, the psychedelic experience as dreaming can vary extremely widely, and this is a model, so simplifications are needed. Uh, a lot of the times we can characterize it as a relatively unconstrained state. Um, and I'll dive more into what that means uh, in a future slide. And uh, to link what I was just talking about with creative generation evaluation, um, you can kind of guess where it falls, and I guess it, is, it also shows it. Um, that for creative generation, uh, ideally, uh, you're typically in a place where you're uh, relatively free from constraints. Um, you want uh, to allow the free flow of ideas to create new um, novel outputs that are not um, just a necessarily reworking of something you already know, but something that's like genuinely innovative. And so, um, so in this whole space you could think of, um, obviously the relative amount of constraints can vary, like I mentioned. Um, sometimes you wanna be a bit more constrained by your emotions um, in what you want to create. And sometimes you want less. Sometimes you want to delivery constrain. Uh, for example, in engineering, you want to come up with a creative solution for this building that requires a bit more constraint than, um, you know, uh, than a piece of artwork, for example, like painting. 
And um, an evaluation, of course, is when you bring in more of the deliberate constraints um, and maybe more of automatic constraints. So a deliberate is again, evaluating uh, whether a, you know, an idea is feasible, physically feasible, or, um, or is this realistic for the given problem? Um, and then automatic constraints might be relevant for a piece of music. Um, you're not gonna necessarily, you know, uh, I guess it's a component, but you're not gonna rationally think in a very cognitive way, is this good? Um, what's also very important for music and art uh, is how does it make you feel? And on that basis, the evaluation of that output could be based on affect. And honestly, majority of the times, it likely is affect running the show and the emotions and we rationalize it after. Um, but, uh, but these both, uh, but the point here is that evaluation involves greater constraints, whether it's deliberate or automatic. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is a framework kind of uh, bringing all together. And um, this framework is a cognitive neuroscience framework. So it also makes hypotheses about brain uh, interactions. And so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, and so let's talk about a bit about brain networks. Like everyone likes brain networks. So I'll chat about that a bit. So we're gonna focus on the default mode network. It's labeled as the DN here, default network and also the frontal parietal control network, uh, which is in the reddish color here. And um, very briefly, uh, default mode network, uh, some of you might know, some of you uh, might not know, like a lot of uh, research suggests that you could divide it into subsystems. Some say two, some say three. Um, this is going based on a three subsystem model. Um, most relevant for us is the so-called default mode network medial temporal lobe submodel, which is uh, in purple here. And so let me see if this pointer thing works. Uh, wait, I don't want a highlighter. In any case, you guys can see my pointer. So in purple are areas in this one. So these are the hippocampus. A lot of people might have heard of hippocampus. It's just a memory, one of the core memory regions, the parahippocampus and retrosclenial cortex, which are very important in linking the hippocampus to the rest of the cortex and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is also very much involved in memory areas and linking it to things such as the amygdala and emotional kind of other subcortical responses. And so this subnetwork of the default mode network is the most linked to memory, we could say. Um, it's not necessarily the only one, but like we could talk, talk about it in that sense. It's linked to uh, the type of memory that uh, we're referring to here. And the frontal parietal control network in red. Um, the most important node in this is the so-called uh, is the dorsal lateral dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So this is kind of an executive region in the brain that um, mediates our ability to deploy top-down deliberate attention. Um, so it actually it has a lot of connectivity to other regions and it can actually amplify their activity based on your attention. So when you're trying to focus on, you know you. Uh, on anything, on a car in the distance, and you want to really want to focus on it and examine it, dorsolateral PFC is maybe amplifying activity in visual areas in your brain to increase the fidelity of that representation, so you're able to perceive it more. So DLPFC is a core attentional region. And so the idea here is that um, if you look here, and I hope this isn't too much, and we can always come back to it after, um, is that there are sources of variability, such as the default mode network, MTL, which is involved in uh, memory related processes. And there's sources of constraint, such as the frontal parietal control network, which has the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And, um, and so the extent to which we have certain types of constraints uh, on thought involves interactions between these, these uh, different brain networks. Um, so we would expect, for example, if, um, we're freely generating ideas, we'd get more default mode network MTL activity and less in the front of control network and also some of these other networks as well. Uh, whereas if we're constraining it more or evaluating, we're gonna see much more FPCN activity, um, also potentially, uh, where is it here? Oh, salience network activity. And, uh, and these are things which might constrain the thoughts. Um, additional thing I could say here is that salience network is uh, can be linked to automatic constraints. So it's like uh, constraints that are based in emotion or based on external sources, like kind of bottom up attention in a sense. So again, default mode network MTL maybe creates variability in thought, 
where things such as the FPCN um, imposes deliberate constraints and salience network uh, imposes automatic constraints. And so these interact in different ways in creative generation versus evaluation. And some evidence for this. So there have been studies using uh, brain imaging in combination with uh, divergent thinking tasks. Uh, for example, I know here is a brick. Tell me many creative things to do with this brick. Uh, it's an alternate uses task um, and other similar like tasks um, tapping into your ability to just create new novel ideas or ways of associating things. And um, these have suggested that, as you'd expect, there's greater default mode network, and in particular, default mode network MTL that we've talked about in generation. And then in the evaluation phase, um, the default mode network is often also active, but the FPCN, the Frontier Parallel Control Network, and Salience Network also become online and sometimes more connected to the default mode network. So it's, uh, it really fits this model where when you're creating ideas, you're tapping into the memory stores within the default mode network. And subsequently, you're bringing these, these kind of executive functioning um, attentional reasons uh, to interact with the default mode network and kind of evaluate it and uh, determine which of those outputs are worth pursuing further um, and which are just valid uh, creative outputs. And um, here's an interesting other study. They basically had people improvise on the piano. And um, basically, when they told them, you're only allowed playing with white keys and not black keys. Um, that's like a source of constraint because now they can't just freely improvise. The FPCN, the Front of Parallel Control Network, became online with the default mode network. And so this is also suggesting that it's not just the default mode network and creative generation. If there is some constraint or some kind of particular goal that you're aiming for with your creativity, these executive regions can also come online for generation. And so you get this nuanced thing where there's a dance between these different networks and it depends on a number of um, I guess, uh, factors related to the specific type of creativity involved. Um, and uh, so let's talk more about psychedelics. So um, obviously, uh, we all probably know there's lots of anecdotal reports of um, psychedelics enhancing creativity. There's Kerry Mullis, uh, the chemist with the polymerase chain reaction, which is a, a documented for sure case that, uh, that it helped, um, helped her develop this technique. And with Francis Crick, there's uh, you know, the theory, I see the theory because there's a lot of um, stuff um, saying it's not true and so quote unquote debunking it online. But um, there's a lot of, there's a potential that it helped Francis Crick uh, discover the DNA helix. And of course, there's, uh, you talk to any of your friends who've tripped and they've probably had a, an experience where they uh, had a new idea and it had some kind of creativity boost. And um, if you look at the early research, early as in pre, let's say 1970, it's actually pretty inconclusive and it wasn't always unequivocally showing a positive finding. Um, and, but on top of that, the, there were questionable scientific standards. So they weren't really met methodologically rigorous. You know, they used just the measures they invented that weren't psychometrically validated. Uh, they rarely had placebo, you know, they probably almost always didn't have placebo conditions, didn't have proper controls. Um, it was kind of, you know, uh, nowhere near the rigor from today's standards. So it's like you need to take it as a, with a grain of salt. And modern research is relatively limited. We're obviously still in the infancy of um, psychedelic research and this, this whole resurgence, um, although it's growing extremely rapidly. Um, there's one study with ayahuasca, um, increased divergent thinking. So they were able to create more associations between rows of pictures. Um, so they were kind of more creative in linking things together. But again, the findings of the study are based on a very small sample. And, um, and there were a number of components of creativity that didn't increase. And so it's kind of like, it's an unclear finding and again, very small sample. And um, this is an interesting one where they found that there's increased spread of semantic activation. And we can interpret this as kind of an increase in associative thinking. So for example, um, what this means is that let's say somebody was to say the word horse and maybe it was to say if you're if you're sober in the normal normal state you'll think oh horse hmm barn stable or racing um and you'll have certain things that are primed when that word is said um and on a psychedelic it's kind of expanded the things that are primed so you'll go like i don't know like horse um racing uh popcorn butter 
uh, gaining weight, <laughs> but like it'll it'll activate so many more things in your semantic network um, than uh, it would have done usually. So it gets that's what they refer to as increased spread of semantic activation in your network of internet connected like concepts. And um, also some microdosing again, very preliminary, mostly you know no placebo control and uh, observational survey research um, showing that this potentially increases in divergent thinking again in creativity for microdosing. Although we really need like randomized control trials, um, you know the proper placebo control with people doing it in the lab, et cetera. Um, and I'm sure those are on their way uh, in the next while. So one interesting potential framework to link these different findings together is uh, increased primary process thinking. And so I have a slide on that. And so uh, this is related to Robin Carhart Harris's entropic brain theory, which is basically um, a theory um, describing psychedelics and related states in terms of two different types of consciousness or cognition. Um, so their primary process and secondary process. Um, so the idea is that psychedelics induce a more primary process state. So let me just start by describing secondary process. So secondary process is a state of consciousness that we're usually engaged in, that I'm engaged in right now, and that probably most of you at least are as well. Um, and it's kind of the state where your um, rational, reflective, um, you know, your thought is orderly and logical and continuous, um, and you're, you're kind of... Um, constrained by what's real in reality. You're not off in magical land. You're like constrained, real, here, present, rational, reflective. And it's kind of the, the type of constrained and um, stable cognition that humans have evolved. Now, primary process thinking, something that um, is in, uh, can be understood to be induced by psychedelics and also in other states, um, of course, in, in types of psychosis and uh, schizophrenia, but also perhaps things like um, temporal lobe epilepsy or after breath work or um, dream states are very primary process, et cetera. So what primary process is exactly is, is a state of cognition, a state of thinking that's hyper-associative, uh, imagistic, so very visual, um, emotionally labile, which means it's susceptible to rapid emotional changes, um, illogical and contradictory. So like things don't really make sense. It's discontinuous. Your mind will jump from one to another topic that's totally unrelated um, and not really constrained by realistic. There's no reality testing. Um, so it's very magical and fantasy-like. Um, for, uh, for those people who have experience with psychedelics, you, you'll probably get the picture here. Um, and increased primary process thinking in the psychedelic state is uh, supported by research. Actually, a number of studies way back in the day in the 70s uh, supported this. And this is also shown by a recent study uh, by a um, researcher, I forgot his first name, but last name Cray Henman uh, in, in Franz Vollenweider's lab in Zurich, uh, where they found increased primary process thinking after 100 micrograms of LSD. And also related to this is like, there was a study showing increased dreamlike imagery under a psychedelic as well, uh, which is also very pr primary uh, process-like. And so this seems to be a, a framework that links together stuff we were talking about before, uh, just about the psychedelic state being um, hyper associative in terms of semantic activation and allowing you to think of novel ideas and associations. Um, and so now let's talk about the framework again. So how uh, I was characterizing the psychedelic state in terms of this framework is of a relatively unconstrained and hyper associative mode of cognition that is conducive to creative generation. And so in terms of everything I've said, this, this you know, more or less makes sense in that um, consistent with primary process thinking, we have less constraints on thoughts, uh, less deliberate and automatic. So your, your mind is kind of able to explore a broader space of potential ideas. Um, and this would be conducive to creating a large volume of, of creative ideas and of new things you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And um, also, as we know that uh, psychedelics can change the extent or amount that we attribute meaning or significance to things. And um, this can allow us to kind of explore or consider things usually we would dismiss as not realistic or, or not worthy of exploration. Um, we can understand that as changing automatic constraints because now um, things that usually wouldn't give you kind of an emotional feeling of value now might, and now so you might explore that and have some cool idea that you would never have thought of. 
And so uh, by reducing your automatic constraints, it can help you pursue novel lines of thought. Of course, not all ideas are novel and useful. You can probably create a whole bunch of ideas in a psychedelic experience, but that doesn't mean all of them, or even the majority of them are gonna be useful. Uh, they might be interesting and funny, but um, it's unclear how much they're gonna be actually useful. And so I would argue that um, it's really good for creative generation, but probably not for creative evaluation. And you would need to evaluate after the experience or with an independent third party uh, to actually determine whether these things are, are novel and useful. And so as a, my paper, as some of you may have read, uh, is like uh, primary theoretical. So it's like just talking about what I just talked about, but I also did some very preliminary analyses on the LSD data from, LS, uh, from ICL. Basically, I, I looked at the correlations between brain network functional connectivity, so networks such as the DFMO network, front of parietal network, et cetera, um, and self-reports that they collected. So uh, mainly I looked at two different self-report measures, but the most relevant one is basically people reported from one to seven, how much they had more original thoughts. Um, and of course, this is like a very crude thing and a very uh, uh, preliminary thing that just, just to kind of motivate future research. Um, and basically what I found was that people who reported having more original thoughts had less of a decrease in default mode network um, core and front of parietal control network functional connectivity. Which is, um, so this implies that usually this is relative to placebo. So that relative to placebo, you get a decrease in the default mode network and front of parietal control network. But in the people who had less of a decrease in these networks had more original thoughts. Um, and moreover, they had um, greater decreases in this other node, the default mode network, MTL, uh, uh, region or subnetwork. And so it seems like there's this interesting thing where there's a dissociation between different subsystems of the DFMO network, where in the core, which is, um, I didn't really talk about it, but it's the midline of the DFMO network, the medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex is increasing less, whereas uh, the more memory oriented aspect of the DFMO network is increasing more. Um, and also, so this suggests at least that there's in interesting dissociations going on at the level of inside the DFMO network. And this is something that hasn't been acknowledged uh, in past work. Um, and I'm very hesitant to interpret this in more detail because again, it, it was based on a limited sample of 15 people using a kind of crude basic self-report measure. And to be honest, I, I don't truly believe this finding. It really need, really need like better measures in larger samples. Uh, it's really, uh, correlations are very reliable if you have less than even 30 people with fMRI, let alone 15. So I uh, take that with a grain of salt, but it seems something perhaps might be going on with these networks as we kind of predict, predict based on the model. And um, yeah, so we need randomized placebo control trials, trials with creativity tasks in combination with uh, people on psychedelics and also ideally fMRI uh, because I'm a fMRI researcher and I like fMRI. Um, and um, yeah, so we need more of that with large samples, at least 30 to 50 people to really have reliable correlations with behavior like this. Um, yeah, so conclusion, creativity is a dynamic process um, composed of the neurocognitively dissociable states of creative generation and evaluation. Uh, these different states can be characterized in terms of the type and degree of constraint. And the competition between constraint and variability on thought involves interactions between multiple brain networks. Lastly, the psychedelic experience is a relatively unconstrained um, state of consciousness, state of conscious uh, cognition that may be conducive to creative generation. And that's my talk. Uh, you can also check out my YouTube channel <laughs> where I provide uh, accessible videos on the latest in psychedelic science. Um, it's a sample of some of my recent, recent videos. Uh, where I really just like made this to one, just share friends and family, you know, what I'm, all this drug stuff that I'm into is. And also just to kind of provide a medium of information that's not a, like super superficial, like a lot of the media treatments and that's faithful to the science, but is also accessible to the lay person. Um, so I really just try to make this offering to help people um, explore and understand the research in kind of a way that's faithful to, you know, what's actually going on. So you can search me up on YouTube or Instagram, just the psychedelic scientist, if you're interested. And here are my references and that's it for me. So thanks so much for everyone for listening and your attention. Happy, happy to answer any questions. <laughs>
Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Manesh. Um, really interesting presentation, and it's going to be even more interesting when we get to higher powered studies with more individuals in the future. Um, and for everyone on the call, if you haven't checked out his YouTube channel, it's really awesome. I've seen some of your videos. They're fantastic. And like you said, like very well grounded uh, in the science. Thank you. So uh, for questions, we can kind of do the same thing that we did with Matt. If anyone has a question, just please raise your hand on the uh, on the Zoom chat and then get your question answered. I've got one to just kind of start things off. Um, I, I'm curious if there are any studies done um, where they kind of, they gave people psychedelics and then tried to get them to do some complex problem solving. When I say that complex problem solving, I'm talking like mathematical proofs or difficult things, um, equations, like physics problems, that kind of thing. Do you, do you know if, if any of that work has been done in the past? Uh, not recently. I think uh, James Fadiman, Jim Fadiman, back in 1966, they had this paper where they had uh, experts in different fields come together and uh, try to come to breakthroughs on like roadblocks they had. Um, and um, as far as I remember, they had a lot of positive findings there of people finding new novel solutions to very technical problems in their field. Um, but as the story goes, the, the FDA knocked on their door and told them to shut it down midway, uh, kind of like a, like a fable in the psychedelic lore these days. But, um, but there's nothing recent as far as I know of people doing that, um, but definitely super interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Lindsay, I think you had a question. Do you want me to read it or do you want to go for it there? Oh, sure. I guess I can just ask it. Um, it's like a little bit off topic, but I was wondering like if you know of any research or have any ideas about like the retention of these kind of like new and re like creative ideas that people may think of while like using psychedelics. Do you have like any insight on if like, they kind of tend to forget them? Like they remember like in the moment or like shortly after, or if they seem kind of like well remembered, I'm kind of interested if that, if they, yeah, are, there's retention of those ideas. Totally. I mean, it's really interesting, but I, I don't know. I'm not sure if data was collected on that, right? Like with this data set that they have that I've been using, uh, it's just one to seven. Like, did you have original ideas? But it would have been really interesting if you're like, okay, you, you did. So like list them out and see if they actually remember. Because so I think there's also the interesting uh, fact, I guess, that, you know, you might think like, oh, I had so many original ideas on that trip. And then when they actually sit down to think about it concretely and try to write them, they're like, Hmm, maybe not like right so there's like there's a it could be a discrepancy between the subjective sense of having creativity versus actually so i think that's like a really important thing that should be researched uh, at some point mm -hmm. awesome thank you i was also just like curious like after you've like written this paper like kind of like what's like the next step for you do you have kind of like a follow-up thing that you're working on that you'd be willing to share like yeah, I just, I just think like, it's so interesting. So I'd be wondering what kind of like what you've thought of as the next step. Yeah, totally. So actually, well, I have two projects ongoing with their data sets from ICL. I'm actually not related to creativity at the moment. Although I could say there is a paper explicitly evaluating some of the hypotheses of this model coming out, not by me though. Um, uh, I, I reviewed it actually for a journal so that it should be out in some time. Um, what I'm working on right now and I'm most excited about is I'm doing a systematic comparison of LSD versus psilocybin versus DMT using functional connectivity and also some other analyses uh, to kind of really like see what's common between these and the brain changes and what's different and um, can we come up find correlations with ego dissolution for example that's common across all three because so far it's all been very like distinctly done in kind of uh, this haphazard way so it'd be I'm really excited to Bring it all together so that's kind of what i'm working on right now i'm excited about i'm also very excited about that please pass that on to us when when you're done <laughs> yeah totally totally do you do you have any predictions on what what that's going to look like in terms of comparing those three drugs with fmri yeah yeah well i've, I've already computed most of the results so i'll, I'll kind of okay. share a bit it, it's like hmm. the general picture is that uh, a common across all three is that these kind of networks that are more, you could say high level. So, so like non-sensory networks, we could say. So like, um, like the frontal part of control network, p mode network, uh, salience network, dorsal attention network, networks that are more, we call them association networks, more advanced, more connected to the rest of the brain. Those in particular seem to become much more connected to everything. Whereas it's a different story for certain sensory areas. So it's as if in the brain, higher level processing takes up um, uh, kind of more precedent. Like there's more information exchange going on at these high levels. 
And, um, and so, yeah, like one of the things I'm exploring now and like thinking about is how to link this to like Rebus and uh, the idea of a loosening of top-down priors and like how much it holds up in terms of these comparisons. Um, but it seems to be something going on specifically with these high level networks becoming very interconnected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, awesome. Thank you for sharing the, uh, the, the new, new data with us and that as well. Um, I guess this, this might be a tough question. Like what does, how does that apply to clinical work or how can you see your work impacting what happens in the clinic um, as these drugs start to become um, used more often um, in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy? Yeah, totally. I think um, what I'm most interested in is that is like, how can we better understand and kind of from a me mechanistic perspective what's going on to, to give rise to these changes, these improvements, right? Because I think um, there's a lot of stuff, for example, describing depression as you're kind of, you know, obviously stuck in these habitual modes of thinking and your effective emotional system is kind of um, not as calibrated, you, you're less effective. You're less sensitive to positive emotions, more sensitive to negative. And um, it could be by that, uh, by inducing this hyperconnectivity between all these high level networks, we're able to kind of uh, increase the dynamic range of states the brain can go into, right? Um, this is kind of along the lines of what Robin's work as well. It's like by, we can kind of understand a little bit of the brain of why these changes might be happening in terms of uh, depression. If we're able to, see how these normal uh, kind of entrenched modes of connectivity and interactivity between brain regions is now changed or shift out, shifted out of. Um, that's a cool narrative to describe, you know, what's going on. Otherwise, it's like, you know, we can, I feel like we can debate endlessly on psychological theories, um, but it's, easy, it's more, perhaps more tractable to look at in the brain what's happening, right? So that's kind of the interest. But obviously, we're very far from really understanding a lot of this stuff because uh, very early and, and again samples are quite small with these data sets. Yeah, awesome. Well, that's why we have people like yourself, right? Uh, this stuff needs to be investigated and we need to find out exactly what's going on. So yeah, thank you for doing that. Totally. Um, I, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So if anyone does have one, please, please raise your hand. Um, I had one more, one last question just about um, creativity. Um, do we see a the change in creativity as we age or has anyone measured that and, and is there a peak in creativity uh, at a certain point in our, in our life and does that decline um, mm -hmm. as we age yeah it's an interesting question I, one of my pi uh, actually one of the things he researches is aging and so i'm around a lot of aging work in my lab and what's interesting about as you age you become more reliant on um, your stored knowledge as opposed to your kind of cognitive control you're less like thinking in the moment, more just like, oh, like what have I experienced before that is similar? And so I think it's very possible um, that as you get older, um, hmm, you can come to, I would say creativity is probably reduced and is like an, a, an optimization. Because once you get older, you get too stuck in habitual, uh, relying on your knowledge of past experiences, relying on past knowledge and ways you've responded previously, right? So I really think that at some point, maybe, I don't know, in your 30s or late 20s or something, when there's a good mix of past experiences of good knowledge, um, but also your cognitive abilities are still intact and so you're able to bring them together, which is what you're seeing when the front of the control network interacts with the deeper mode network, right? It's like these two worlds interacting. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Leo or Lindsay, if you guys have any more questions, like, please feel free to ask. I don't think we have any more from the audience. Um, and if not, we can just wrap it up. You guys are good? I think okay. I have all my answers or my questions answered and you asked some really good ones there actually. So that was awesome. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, so yeah, I will, thanks again, Manesh. Um, again, everyone, please check out his YouTube channel. It's awesome. Um, and then I'm just gonna pass things off to Leo uh, to close things out for us. All right, thank you guys for tuning in today. Um, so our next meeting is April 22nd, right after bicycle day. And uh, it will be at 5 p.m. EST because one of our speakers is actually talking to us from Europe. So it'll be pretty late over there. Um, so currently we have uh, CJ Healy. They are booked uh, to talk about the acute effect of classical psychedelics on memory in humans. And Andrea Lupi, who will be discussing the dynamics of brain integration and segregation under LSD. So um, stay tuned to our emails. Um, we send them out through MailChimp, but sometimes they might go to your junk. So. If you can uh, mark it as not spam, that would be really great for us as well.
And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you guys next month. Take care. Bye-bye.